Welcome to thegolfdirector.com. This is coverage of the majors with George Honeycutt and you, Roy the Third. We want to welcome you today to our first segment of coverage of the majors for 2014. We are beginning our review today of Augusta National and the Masters. Of course, coverage of the majors, we're going to bring you up to speed on the pre-terminant events, what's going on with the golf courses for not only Augusta National, but we'll also be talking with you about the U.S. Open, the British Open, the Open Championship as it's referred to, the PGA Championship, and then for 2014, we're also going to be giving some insight into two special events. The Players Championship course coming up May 2014, and then we'll be discussing the Ryder Cup. And of course, everybody's excited and looking forward to that. Hugh, let's first, let's jump into Augusta National, of course, one of our favorite places in the whole wide world. Absolutely. And uh, again, a brief history of Augusta. The golf course itself, the original land was a Fruitland nursery that was purchased in 1931. Then Dr. Alistair McKenzie was asked to come in and do the course architecture. Uh, he was brought in. The, the lay of the land, per se, was laid out perfectly for a golf course per Bobby Jones, Clifford Roberts, and the others that initially looked at the properties. The golf course itself was opened in 1932 in December, and then it originally had a clubhouse already on the property, Hugh. Uh, that clubhouse was built actually in 1854. It's, yes. It was known to be one of the first concrete homes, per se, or clubhouses actually built in back that time. And then, of course, the Masters itself started in 1934 with Horton Smith winning the first one. So what we want to do today on coverage of the majors is to get you going as far as your insight. We're hoping to provide you some intellect, some insight, and some good conversation on the golf course, the players, and then, of course, the tournament itself. Let's start off at Augusta National. We're leaving the clubhouse now, and we're taking a slight right turn, walking out of the pro shop, and we're headed right down a slight incline to number one tee box. Number one is T Olive. It is a par four at 445 yards, and interestingly enough, it's a pretty wide fairway except for a rather large, sizable bunker that's down on the right-hand side. Interestingly, when the hole was first designed, there was a bunker on the left. Yes. But in 1954, that bunker was removed. The players will be aiming down the left center and, <coughs> excuse me, folks, in hopes that they do not pull it a little bit because the fairway itself actually slides toward the left and they may get in the trees. Yeah, the trees, you got the pine trees with all the pine straw. But I tell you what, George, this is probably one of the most intimidating starting holes, tee shots in golf. It, it is. It's an exposed tee box and it's right there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And there's nothing really around it except the clubhouse to your right and just people everywhere. People everywhere. But interestingly, too, is the, the hard part of number one, or tea olive, as it's called, is the green itself. It's not so much the drive. It's not so much that, you know, getting the ball laid up. It's, it's the, where the pin is on this green complex itself. This green complex actually has three different segment areas uh, where it, from the middle, it slopes severely front. Then from the left middle, it slopes sever severely left toward a front left bunker, and then it slopes away from the players, starting from the middle, headed to the back. So there are three distinctive tiers in this green that make it quite challenging for you to play your opening shots at Augusta National. Absolutely, and this is where you'll hear us say a lot, folks, from the standpoint that, you know, when you hit into the greens at Augusta, it's quadrant golf. I mean, it is you basically break these greens down into quadrants, and that's how you have to play them. Exactly. Let's head to number two, which is really a... a first challenging hole that the player themselves are going to be able to pull out the big dog, the driver, and they're going to be hitting it with all they've got with a little draw. And when I say a draw, the fader is going to be playing down the left-hand side, which is going to be down the tree line in hopes that they do not pull it too far left. But the optimal drive here is playing it targeted off the fairway bunkers that you'll see on the right-hand side at the dog leg, and then putting about a 10- to 12-yard draw on it, hoping to catch the slot coming off the fairway. This is a total hole of 575 yards that is primarily downhill from the tee box. Yes, and it's one of those that, you know, the, the hardest part about this hole is your tee shot. 
Because if you don't hit the right spot and hit it in the fairway, you see a lot of guys to the left over in the creek down in the pine trees, and you see them in that bunker on the right. If you can hit the fairway, then you give yourself a shot at trying to get to the green or put it up there just short. So, again, this green is severely guarded by uh, front bunkers to the point where uh, all the players primarily are going to be trying to reach this green in two unless they have pulled their tee shot left. If not, they're going to be going for the green in two, but then it's very difficult to keep the ball on the green with a long approach shot. So par f the number two par five always ends up being a pivotal hole to where you can see anywhere from a two like we saw last year, yes. Hugh, all the way up to six or seven depending on how they get into the bunkers and then how they're able to putt depending on where the pin position is. Exactly. Number three is a par four that you're actually climbing back up the hill again. And you'll hear us talk about this, folks. The undulation elevation changes at Augusta are really not depicted on television. So if you have not had the wonderful opportunity of setting your feet on heaven, then you're going to have to understand that there is a lot of elevation change in the Augusta National 18-hole golf course. Number three, Flowery Branch. It headed back uphill. It is a routine par four for the players. However, it is a tight driving area to a tight landing area covered well by a bunker left. And then, of course, you have a somewhat kidney-shaped green that has two distinct uh, arms off the green, let's say, uh, to the point you've got the fat part of the green, which is uh, the, the higher portion of the green, and then that either slopes left, going down to a finger portion of the green, or it slopes back right, going to a rear pin position. That can cause havoc to those trying to hit a wedge to a mid iron into this hole. Absolutely. I mean, you'll see anything from a long iron or a hybrid off the tee to a three wood to a driver. I mean, you've got four bunkers on the left over there that, I mean, if you can't carry them, you sure don't want to be in them trying to shoot into this green because this green sits elevated with a severe slope that comes off that front. And if it doesn't get to the green or hits on the front and spins, it's coming all the way back down the fairway. Number five, number four, excuse me, is uh, flowering crab apple. This is the first par three that the players will see on the front nine at Augusta National. It is 240 yards directly downhill. And interestingly is, is the size and shape of this green. It does add uh, clubs as much as two to two and a half clubs depending on pin position and where they have the tee markers on that particular day. But however, you do have a large massive bunker protecting the front middle to front right of the green. And then you have a, a, a smaller bunker that's off to the left side of the green and interestingly that smaller bunker off to the left you would really not think it comes into play but however you will see a lot of players that either one pull their shot or two bail out left and end up in that bunker trying to make three coming off of this somewhat uh, really intimidated hole but it will intimidate you as you reach it and try to play it and i tell you this is the hardest par three on this golf course i mean they can talk about 12 all they want this hole right here with the distance and the smallness of this green it is a very very difficult golf hole you'll find the the players as they come through number four on crab apple is those players that hit the ball high and are able to stop it in a relatively short distance uh, seem to it seems to favor their approach. Yes. If they are low, if they sling hooks in or they hit low fades or whatever, then they have a tough time holding the green surface and they find themselves recovering. And you'll just find to make you'll find during this tournament you'll see more fours and fives than you will threes, which is interesting. So it's just, it seems like an undaunting par three. Number five is Magnolia, and this is probably one of the better par fours at Augusta National. It is a tee ball that requires you to hit uh, severely uphill. Yes. It is an uphill drive that uh, it is actually, if you look at the hole the way it lays out, it is a dog leg left. So you're, what you're trying to do is hit your tee ball as far up the fairway as possible without entering into the two large bunkers that are up on the fairway about 145 to 160 off the green surface and 
the, the total hole distance is 455 yards, so you are going to have to hit a good drive here, and then you're probably going to have a mid iron to, say, an eight to nine iron for the longer hitters. The Bubba's or whatever have been known to hit mm -hmm. nine and eight irons, but however, your your standard PGA Tour player is probably going to be hitting six to seven, and this also is indicative of the wind that comes in. This is the back part of the property. It does have a lot of tree surface area, but however, you do get swirling winds behind the green, which will affect the flight of the ball as it comes into this two-tier green surface. And what really gets me about this hole, George, when you watch it, and, and being there in person and watching it and, and being able to play there a few times, that you know everybody wants to try to hug that bunker and turn it around those two bunkers, and you're better off just shooting it up the right side of the fairway and taking your medicine, getting on the green, making four, and just get out and get on to number there six. There is a lot of fairway up on the far, from middle right, there is a There's lot a of fairway. There's a ton. And so thusly, the player really, just to take advantage of that, he should just play the little fade or even set up the draw off the right hand side rough and bring it back in and just not even mess with those bunkers because those bunkers are almost an automatic of a five if not a six. I mean they look like something that comes out of World War II that you know right. they dropped a big bomb because I mean they're that deep and that cavernous and it just is tough. Number six is Juniper. I believe one of the prettiest golf holes at Augusta National. It is a par three directly downhill and interestingly folks during the television coverage that you'll be seeing you will see a massive amount of patrons that will be between the tee box and the green that they allow spectators to enter that fairway area to m watch this golf hole. And that, because the players do not see them from the tee box. No, That's how can't. elevated they are. Yes, I mean they can sit on the side of that hill and just watch you know, watch the green and, and the players don't even know they're there until they come walking down. Until they come walking down, exactly. Again, number six is 180 yard par three and what makes this hole so interesting is where the pin is positioned. You are, again, your tee shot is coming out of a shoot of trees uh, down the hill, but if the, gr if the pin is placed on the right-hand side, and keep this in mind, folks, if it's placed on the right-hand side, you have a, uh, a landing area of about 30 feet in diameter to get your ball to hit and stop to stay on that same level. What you will see is a lot of players, if the pin is right, you'll see a lot of players going for the pin, it hitting, but they're just left of the target line on the pin itself, and then it will catch that slope in the middle of the green and come all the way back down, and now they find themselves with a 50, 60, 70 footer trying to for a birdie putt exactly and i think you're being generous giving it 30 feet i think it's more about 15 to 18 because i mean it just looks like it's the top of a pin sitting up there on the top right over there when they put that pin well back. the first time i played there i went out and actually walked it off and at that time it was about 30 feet in diameter so that's the only reason i say that was based off of my calculations but like you said it's probably a lot smaller it looks a lot smaller so, i can promise you number seven is pompous and this is a really just kind of a Land par four, however, when you talk to the players, number seven always seems to come up on their radar as I need to make sure that I hit the absolute perfect drive on this hole. It is a, a just a straightaway par four, but however, it is it's like you're hitting down a tunnel of pine trees. And it's 450 yards, and the, the approach shot, your second shot, is uphill. So you, you always seem to have wind in your face. Yes. It's an uphill second shot. So you're looking at a very uh, nervous cautious drive down the center and so the trees don't come into play on your approach or even you know that you have to hit it back out into the fairway but then after you dissect the fairway then you've got to make a very calculated approach shot to this elevated green that is protected by more sand than I think you know you'll see anywhere else exactly and I mean in this whole like you say undawning it used to be because it used to be only you know basically 385 yards or so and you know you could hit whatever you wanted off the tee. Now that they've made it 450, they've created a man-sized par four here. And this green does sit uphill, but it is exposed. 
So they're, you know, the only trees you have are the ones that are to the right over near 17. So, I mean, this green is exposed and it's tough to figure out. And this green's not big as the top of this counter we're sitting at. And, and Hugh, as you know, as I know, as you're standing down in that fairway, hitting up to that, you do not feel any wind up on that green. No, because you're blocked by the you're, trees. You're blocked by the trees. Number eight is yellow jasmine. And this gets a lot of television coverage, folks. This is the second par five on the front nine at Augusta National. It is 570 yards. It is entirely uphill. You are hitting your tee shot into a quote-unquote flat landing area. You'll want to put a little draw on the ball. Uh, for those that are faders, they will aim down the left-hand side of the quote-unquote fairway and just let it fall back in. The, the aspects of yellow jasmine are is the green is reachable by most of the players that will be in this event. However, your target for reaching the green is unseen. It is a blind second shot, and you are simply taking either an azalea bush or a tree or a cloud in the sky and making it your target exactly. line. And then what you're doing also is you're hoping to get a relatively decent bounce or landing off of your second shot, if you're going for the green and two, off of the multiple mounds that are built around this green surface. And it really tightens up the green surface, Hugh, but also, too, it gives you bailout areas to where if you pull it a little bit with a draw, or even if you push it a little bit with a fade, you still have recoverable area that you can get up and down from on your third and still have a birdie opportunity. You do. And, you know, basically your second shot into this is you've almost got to hit a duck hook, George, to get there, and you see a lot of guys try to do it, and they bail out and hit it right over there where they're hitting, you know, 30, 40 yard wedge shots. And we've seen players in the past, from Jack Nicklaus to Arnold Palmer to Ernie Els, who Ernie Els just a couple years ago snapped a three wood, literally thought it was in the trees left. However, he had hit one of the front left mounds, and it just happened to kick right. It almost looked like it hit a sprinkler head, yeah. and it just happened to kick right. It got on the putting surface, and he gets up there and finds himself only 12 feet away way for eagle so number eight yellow jasmine is going to be one of those let's say uh score turners because there's every opportunity to make three here but there's also the average score is going to run about five and if you don't make four you're getting lapped number nine this is a great front finishing hole for Augusta National. It's called Carolina Cherry. It's a par four 460 yards and really you're you're you want to place one of your best drives down the right-hand side middle on this hole. You'll pick up a little roll off the downslope of the fairways, and then you have an uphill approach to a really, Hugh, a three-tier green. It is. It's three tiers. I mean, you've got different quadrants on those tiers. So, I mean, again, it's broken down in geometry when you're trying to hit, figure out your second shot. As you stand on the green and look around, you actually see, uh, I, I saw as much as six different shelves. Yes. So... Depending on where the pin is, you're going to be adding clubs. You're going to be subtracting clubs. Depending on where the pin is, you're going to be coming, hitting your shot with either dead hands or a lot of spin. Mm -hmm. It just really depends on where the pin is on number nine, the Carolina Cherry Hole, as to how you're going to play this golf hole. Mostly everybody's going to hit the fairway. Uh, this hole dictates how you hit your second shot. And then if you're above the hole, and depending on that pin placement, you're easily looking at a three putt. And again, this is where you and I kind of differ a bit. I think the tee shot's the hardest part of this hole. I think you've got to hit a good tee shot. You've got to put it in the right place to be able to choose the type of shot you want to play into this green. I have known players that just go ahead and purposely put it into the green side bunkers that are front left uh, just to help them control that third shot if they're recovering from a bad spot. Exactly. Fairway. Because if you so, hit it left in the trees, you will not get it on the green. Well, you don't want to hit it right of the green surface. You're going to be down a, a, a severe undulation. So really... The, the approach shot here, the drive, the approach shot and all, it is a demanding par four, although on television it looks very, you know, what, what's so big about it. Well, so. because when they show it to you from the green, it looks like it's wide open, but standing on a tee box, it looks like the number seven, like you're hitting down the hallway. Well, we have covered the front nine holes at Augusta National here on the golfdirector.com coverage of the majors. Coming up very soon, we'll be going over the back nine for you, and then in following shows, of course, we'll be covering the players and the the overall history of Augusta National. This has been Hugh Roy III and George Honeycutt thanking you for joining us today on Coverage of the Majors, brought to you by the Zeus Radio Network. Music.